Hi everyone, this is a review session for the Unit 2 exam for ESSC 101. Um, I'm going to be going through the review questions that are in Moodle uh, for that exam. So we're going to go over all of Unit 2. Did I say Unit 1? I meant Unit 2. <laughs> um, so we're going to be going over all of the mineral lectures and all of the rock lectures, and we're going to follow those questions on the, uh, the review guide. So first thing I'm going to do is do a share screen thing so that you guys can see everything that I'm seeing in Moodle. You just want to go navigate to unit two. Um, this is the unit two big picture, the rock cycle, all of the individual lectures and um, something new I just did yesterday. All of the lecture links have been replaced with Panopto. So now you can view the captions. Uh, hopefully that's helpful to you. Um, and then all the way down at the bottom with the exam materials, uh, we have the unit two review questions. We're going to be reviewing those questions and then I'll post the video um, under all of the same material. Here's the exam. And don't forget about the extra credit assignment where um, one of the questions that I go over in this video will be asked when you can submit that for extra credit. So if you go to unit two review questions, it's this list of questions, and we're going to go over the answers to all of these. Um, I just want to remove extraneous stuff here so that you can see what I'm doing. We're going to go through all of these, and they're in chronological order. So number one is the first thing that I cover in lecture six, and then it goes all the way through to metamorphic rocks from lecture 11. Maybe it's just uh, some general advice about this unit is definitely don't underestimate it. Um, it's tough. Um, it uh, requires a little bit of your understanding of, um, of some basic chemistry. Nothing beyond what I cover in the first and second lecture is part of this unit. Um, but for that reason alone, it can be challenging to some people. Another thing that I want to do before I even get started with the questions is give you guys an idea of names of the rocks and minerals that will actually appear on the exam. So I call this my fair game rock and mineral list. And you don't need to know everything about these. You don't need to know any chemical formulas. Um, just, you know, distill down a ton of mineral and rock names I use down in all of the lectures to just this much shorter list. And these are the names that will actually appear on the exam. For minerals, I tend to isolate it to just quartz, mica slash biotite, feldspar, and calcite. I believe those should be the main minerals that you'll actually see named on the exam. So mineral groups are still fair game, um, uh, silicate structures, uh, just, you know, for the actual names of minerals, I try to just kind of keep it down to this. For igneous rocks, I try to keep it really simple, just granite and basalt. For um, sedimentary rocks, I use a few more because the sedimentary rocks all have really easy names for the most part. So sandstone, shale slash mudstone, coal, and limestone. For the metamorphic rocks, I try to keep it pretty simple and just confine it to um, quartzite and marble. So that's you know less than twenty rocks and mineral rock and mineral names, as opposed to you know probably closer to a hundred when you think about all of the different mineral and rock names that go over in all of those lectures. So hopefully that kind of helps keep it a little bit more simplified for the purpose of the exam. Now I'm going to start going through these questions. I always make word angry when I start trying to go through and answer these. 
um, because it always likes to try to stick extra numbers in there. The first question is the very, very first concept that I go over in lecture six, which is the first lecture that's part of this unit. The question is, what is a mineral? Give the five criteria for minerals and include examples of substances that would not be considered minerals. So a mineral is an inorganic, so I'm going over the five criteria now, naturally occurring solid material with a specific composition and routine atomic structure. Now, as I've mentioned before, part of this is um, a little repetitive because to have a routine, um, predictable atomic structure, it also also be a solid, um, but nothing in a liquid state, nothing in a gaseous state, obviously. So examples of non-minerals would basically be anything that does not follow one of these criteria in the list of um, criteria for um, minerals. So examples of non-minerals would be, you know, something that's organic, um, something like bones, teeth, they all have routine atomic structures, a specific composition, they're naturally occurring, but they are organic. They are something that's derived from a life process. So those would be examples of non-minerals, something that's man-made. Uh, so, you know, for instance, uh, um, a fake diamond, a cubic zirconium, um, something like steel would be an example of something that is not naturally occurring something that's not solid, water, for instance. And you could go on and on and on. Um, so if you go through or answer this question on your own, you can just come up with other things that um, do not qualify because they don't follow this one of those five criteria in the definition of a mineral. One of the things that makes a mineral different than a rock is the fact that um, minerals have this last part of the um, definition of a mineral, which is the specific composition and the routine atomic structure. Because most rocks are made up of an aggregate of minerals, um, they don't have that um, specific composition. Instead, they have a range of compositions and they don't have a specific atomic structure because they're made up of several different minerals, all with different atomic structures. So one of the things that I always go back to as part of this unit, it's kind of our mantra that you might remember from the lectures, elements make up minerals, minerals make up rocks. So going forward, questions three through seven are all about rocks. Questions one and two are all about minerals. Now for this next question, Discuss how a mineral's physical and chemical properties are a manifestation of their internal chemical composition and structure. So essentially what I'm asking for is a little bit of a discussion of mineral properties. So we don't have to go through all of the mineral properties as part of this question. We're just going to go through some of them and talk about how um, that property is dependent on something innate and internal in the mineral itself. So in the same way that your DNA makes up everything about you, a mineral's properties are going to be dependent on what's going on at the atomic level. So what we can do, and you know, one way I'd describe answering this question is to just go through a diff couple of the different properties and talk about how they're related to composition, structure, or both. So one of the properties that we can go back to that's very dependent on a mineral structure is, um, is hardness. A mineral's hardness is going to be on a one through 10 scale that we call Mohs scale. It can be defined as resistance to scratching. And is dependent on a dependent mainly 
on a minerals atomic structure. Now the reason why mineral hardness is dependent upon the atomic structure is it's dependent on the bonds between the atoms. And that goes back to structure more so than composition. So strong atomic bonds like covalent bonding makes harder minerals. So the hardest naturally occurring substance, the hardest mineral, a diamond, is actually carbon that's been covalently bonded in all directions. And that's why it's a hard mineral. Um, silicates are also really hard minerals. And this basic silicate structure is silicon and oxygen that's all been covalently bonded together. And whether or not there's covalent bonds between the silicate tetrahedra gives us all of these different silicate structures. So hardness is something that you can innately tie back to atomic structure. A mineral property that might be a little bit more related to something like composition would be um, uh, possibly color, although that kind of gets complicated, um, but something like specific gravity. Or more in layman's terms, the weight of minerals or the weight as they relate to water. Um, so weight is going to be something that's also dependent on how much of a substance that you have. And so specific gravity is just a way of saying that where you're comparing apples to apples. It means the same total amount of one mineral versus another is going to be heavier in some minerals because they're made up of heavier elements. So the specific gravity is mainly dependent on the composition of a mineral. Heavy minerals are composed of heavy elements. Um, classically, um, heavy minerals would include things like galena, which is a lead sulfide. Lead's really heavy. Um, barite. It's a barium sulfate. Ba both barium and sulfur are really heavy elements. Um, examples of minerals that are a lot lighter are carbon-based minerals like uh, graphite and diamond is actually comparably pretty light um, compared to things like silicates and sulfates. Um, so this is going to be something that's almost entirely dependent on composition instead of structure. So this is just two examples. I know it says ask three in here, but you know, you can really take any of the mineral properties and I list off um, 13 different properties and then relate it back to either composition, structure, or in some cases, both. These are just two really straightforward examples, but you can really go through and relate any of those properties to either composition or structure. So moving on a little bit, change this type, tiny little typo here because it's making me nuts. Number three gets us into lecture eight, um, which starts off the rock and mineral lectures. So number three is how does the rock cycle work? Describe how a single rock like a granite can change to each other type of rock as a result of the rock cycle. Um, so this is the more sort of general version of a question that I have a couple down where I talk about just the sedimentary rock cycle in question five. Um, how the overall rock cycle works is by um, taking each of the, um, the types of rocks that we have on planet Earth and transforming them into different types of rocks as part of the processes in the rock cycle. So the rock cycle is a group of processes that transforms rocks on Earth. For example, if you started with a granite, which is an igneous intrusive, well, let's say intrusive igneous,
And you took that granite and you actually exposed it to the Earth's surface. Weathering and erosion would break down the rock into sediment. And if that sediment was later deposited, it could be transformed into sedimentary rock. So that granite that was exposed to the Earth's surface that would be exposed to chemical and physical weathering that would break down that granite into its individual pieces. So that's stuff like quartz and uh, biotite and feldspars. The quartz would round down and form sand grains. The biotite and the feldspars would chemically weather to form clay minerals. And then if you take those layers of clay and those layers of sand, um, deposit them, bury them, then over time that would be lithified to form sedimentary rock, primarily sandstone and shale, if you're starting out with the granite. Those sedimentary rocks could eventually be transformed into metamorphic rocks if the burial and heat pressure increased enough to recrystallize the sediment. So then that sandstone and shale would form something like eventually quartzite and slate, or maybe even eventually a metamorphic rock like a schist. It depends on the grade of metamorphism. eventual melting and resolidification. It doesn't really like the word resolidification for some reason of those rocks would eventually transform the material back into igneous. And depending on the composition of what melted and resolidified, you'd probably wind up with a granite again. And so that's why it's a rock cycle. You can transform it into all of these other types of rocks through surface and subsurface processes, and then get it back to where you started with, which was an igneous rock. So all of the rocks on earth are the results in some way or another of all of these different processes in the rock cycle. Okay, number four is specific to igneous rocks, and it's kind of a deep sort of loaded question, but we'll do our best to answer it. Uh, why do we have variation in the types of igneous rocks that make up the Earth's crust? Example, why do we have continental and oceanic crust? How and where does this crust form? So there's a how and where and why do we have igneous rocks? It's the, the context of the question here. In the span of lectures eight and nine, I answer this question um, sort of half at the end of lecture eight and then the other half at the beginning of lecture nine. The reasons why we have variation in the types of igneous rocks that make up the Earth's crust is because of something called Bowen's reaction series. And that's discussed at the end of lecture eight. You might remember that with the, uh, the Snickers bars. And then the other half of the explanation is the role of plate tectonics and how plate tectonics allows for the melting and resolification of rocks. So the first part of this Bowen's reaction series explains why we form not just one type of igneous rock when rock cools and solidifies, but many types of igneous rocks because of the range in melting and resolidification temperatures in individual minerals. So Bones Reaction Series effectively explains that uh, minerals will melt slash recrystallize, or let's just say crystallize, 
or solidify if you prefer. They'll melt to resolidify at a range of temperatures. So it is possible to form a range of igneous rocks at different stages of mineral formation as igneous as magma plumes rise to the surface. So one of the things that you have to understand to make sense out of this is that magma is going to be less dense than most solid rock. So once you've gotten um, rock hot enough and deep enough underground that it melts, it's going to start rising up to the surface. And then as it does so, it's going to reach these different temperatures where minerals are going to be able to crystallize out. So the first stuff to crystallize out will be what we consider to be the ultramafic rock and then mafic and then intermediate and then eventually felsic. And so you end up with this stratification of different types of igneous rock compositions underground and you get all of these different igneous rocks forming as a result of that range of temperatures as magma rises. So Bowen's reaction series can also be explained with a graph that you've seen as part of the lecture. Um, I think it's more important to be able to understand it just really generally and conceptually as minerals having this range of crystallization temperatures. Um, but if it makes more sense to you to think about it with specific temperatures and specific minerals that form in these ranges, then by all means go for it and, and think about it in those terms. The other aspect of this that I think is really important to igneous rock formation is how um, plate tectonics plays a role. Um, igneous rocks are going to preferentially form at plate boundaries where high temperatures allow for the melting and recrystallization of rocks. Now, um, these plate boundaries are preferentially going to be um, non-transform plate boundaries, so divergent and convergent plate boundaries. Um, mafic rocks form at divergent and some convergent plate boundaries but intermediate and felsic intermediate um intermediate and felsic igneous rocks those compositions only form at uh, convergent plate boundaries where there is continental crust involved. So if you have a divergent plate boundary, you effectively have the splitting apart of the overlying plate and material coming up from the mantle to replace it. So that by nature has to be mafic. And that's why divergent plate boundaries eventually lead to places on earth where oceans are, because that mafic rock is thin and dense. Um, you can only form intermediate or felsic igneous rocks if the melting rock is partially felsic or intermediate to begin with. And so that involves continental crust. So when you have continental oceanic convergence, oceanic crusts of ducts underneath the continent, and magma mixing allows for intermediate rocks to form. If you have uh, continental continental convergence, those continents collide, and then the melting in the deeper parts of the crust eventually allow for um, felsic igneous rocks to form. Usually those are gonna be intrusive felsic igneous rocks. So that's gonna be more like granite. 
So like I promised, four is sort of a loaded question here, but that's why it spanned across a couple of lectures. Go back and if this doesn't make a lot of sense to you, no, that's, this is one of the more difficult concepts I cover in the entire class. And um, use some of that imagery from the lecture videos to kind of help you in the understanding of this material. Question five, describe in detail how a single pre-existing rock has changed at the Earth's surface to form sediment and how that sediment is accreted together to form rocks. So um, this is a question that's specific to the sedimentary rock lectures, um, specifically the first one. So I cover sedimentary rocks in lecture 10 and the first maybe 10, 15 minutes of lecture 11, which is primarily about metamorphic rocks, but a kind of overflow into it a little bit. So the sedimentary rock um, material is first and foremost about all of the different processes that make sediment and then how that sediment comes together to form rock. So the way I break it down in the lecture is to kind of talk about the journey from a pre-existing rock to sediment, how that happens, and then how that sediment eventually forms sedimentary rocks. So I break it down into those two parts of the process. Um, a pre-existing rock is going to be both physically and chemically weathered. And what that basically means is that physical weathering is all about breaking rock into pieces physically through a variety of processes um, that involve things like the freeze thaw cycle, um, uh, you know, basic movement of rocks in uh, rivers and streams, all of these different processes will basically take big rock and just break it into pieces. Having really low temperatures is really critical in that. So you have physical weathering taking place at much, much higher rates in um, high and cold places of the world, like mountaintops. So physically breaking the rock into pieces and changing the mineral compositions through rock water interactions, that's gonna be the chemical weathering part of that, um, is going to change some pre-existing rock into sediment. Transportation of that sediment rounds and sorts the sediment. So it tends to eventually make it into um, uh, rounded pieces. Um, and that's an aspect of having an advanced amount of transportation taking place. And then sorting just means sorted according to grain size. So some sediment transportation, particularly rivers, will only pick up certain size sediments, leaving others behind. And so you get just sands eventually being deposited or just clays, just gravel, depending on the type of sediment transportation involved. Then you end up with sediment that can eventually become sedimentary rock, but only after it gets deposited. So this is the next stage in this game. To take sediment and transport it into sedimentary rock, the first thing that has to happen is sediment must first be deposited. And that's where depositional environments come in. These are places on Earth where sediment is likely to come to rest. So the mouth of rivers, sometimes river channels. I've got a lot of text messages coming in today. I'm so sorry for the constant interruptions. Um, so these are river channels, mouths of rivers, um, sometimes uh, uh, shallow coastline environments, uh, although that's kind of less common, um, places like swamps. So these are typically places that are a little bit more low energy where sediment will eventually come to rest. So the sediment must first be deposited in depositional environments. For example, a delta which is sediment depth position at, at the mouth of a river, the end of a river. And then 
lithification, which I kind of think of as rockification, right, can take place after burial of the sedimentary rock through compaction and cementation. Cementation, right? Cementation. Anyway, okay. That just doesn't really like. Oh, there we go. I just needed to respell it. There we go. Um, so lithification, it can actually be transformed into a rock and take place after burial. So the sediment gets deposited. More sediment gets deposited on top of that. It's buried deeper and deeper underground until the weight of all of that overlying sediment pushes the sediment grains together, reducing the porosity. And then um, water moving through that sediment can precipitate out effectively like glue or cement um, in the form of iron oxides and calcites that then adhere the rock together. And then you have something that's actually going to stick together through all of the different processes that occur after this. So you have a sedimentary rock. Now, the one thing I didn't include in this description is what happens to dissolved load sediment. Um, so sediment can also be dissolved into solution and or precipitated out to form rock. So this is an important part of this too, because this is how we form things like evaporite salts and limestone. So that's question five. Describe in detail how a single pre-existing rock is changed to eventually form sedimentary rocks. So this is the main bulk of what's covered in um, lecture 10. The very beginning of lecture 11, I commit to the second question. How does sedimentary rock analysis enable us to recreate paleo environments? So there's a lot of big words in there that just mean something really simple. How can we use sedimentary rocks as a window into the Earth's past that tell us what things were like in the Earth's past? So, i.e., what three features in sedimentary rock and rocks enable us to determine a depositional environment in the geologic history of the area? So, sedimentary rocks give us this history of the past by allowing us to look at three aspects of the rock. The type of sediment. sedimentary structures and fossils allow us to get an idea of what an area looked like in the distant past. by understanding how those features of the rock came to be present. So essentially we can use the type of sediment or the type of sedimentary rock that's present, sedimentary structures and fossils to recreate this idea of what this environment looked like in the past, because all of those things would have been integral in forming the rock in the first place. So take for instance, um, for example, a coal with um, the sedimentary structure that would be found uh, a coal layered with shale with mud cracks and leaf fossils would indicate to us that the environment was probably a swamp floodplain environment with lots of um, 
decaying plant material. And that would be indicated both by the leaf fossils and the coal found layered with the shale. The shale would be indicative of a really like low energy sedimentary environment like a floodplain or a swamp. Um, and the mud cracks would indicate that the area became arid for some period of time. So the fact that that mud was deposited down in the first place to form shale would indicate that there was a lot of water, a lot of mud present. And then if it dried out enough to actually crack the mud, then that would indicate that maybe there was some change in that environment, maybe a river changed course that allowed it to dry out enough for that mud to crack. And then that gets preserved in the rock so that millions of years later, we can look at all of these things and get an idea of a little bit of a window into the past. And so that's why sedimentary rock analysis is important is because unlike any other type of rock, sedimentary rocks give us this view of the past. The last question is on metamorphic rocks, specifically two aspects of metamorphic rocks that we use to further identify and classify them. So the question is what factors determine the composition and texture of metamorphic rocks? So composition, what the metamorphic rock is made out of, composition of metamorphic rocks is almost entirely dependent on the composition of the parent rock. If you have a marble, then you know that limestone was deeply buried and re-solidified and recrystallized to form that marble. And so the only way that you get a marble is to have something that's composed of calcite like limestone would be. So the parent rock, whatever was actually deposited and buried and recrystallized to form that metamorphic rock is entirely in that case dependent on the composition of the outcome. And I like to describe this in the lectures with a cookie analogy. If you start out with oatmeal raisin cookie dough, then your only possible result after cooking is an oatmeal raisin cookie. You can't make a chocolate chip cookie with oatmeal and raisins. You have to have a completely different starting process product. So the parent rock would be analogous to the cookie dough in this analogy, and the resultant cookie after cooking would be the resultant metamorphic rock. So composition is really straightforward. Composition is just dependent on the composition of the parent rock. Texture is dependent on the processes that metamorphose a rock. And so that is the processes that actually metamorphose that rock is the increase in temperature, pressure, and unequal stresses, which is usually the results of tectonics. So you get all of these different textures forming mainly as a result of this last thing, the, um, uh, the unequal stresses, the effect that tectonic, te tectonics has on creating foliated metamorphic rocks. So the foliation is usually dependent on these unequal stresses. You also get a whole range of resultant metamorphic rocks at different temperatures and pressures with an increase in burial. So you might start out with something like a sedimentary rock, like a shale. You might metamorphose it a little bit to become a slate. You could metamorphose it a lot to, to form something like a schist or a gneiss. And that's just dependent on how much of an increase in temperature and pressure that you have. So this results in different uh, metamorphic textures, like for instance, foliation and different types of foliation and different metamorphic grades. All right, so that's our really quick 
um, speed of light run through all of unit two. This definitely in no way replaces watching the individual lectures. Um, this should hopefully just kind of give you a way to kind of uh, focus your energy when you're trying to study this material for the exam next week. Um, please uh, send me an email if you'd like to meet to discuss any of this or if you have any additional questions and I'd be happy to help you out further. Take care, guys. Bye.